we find ourselves here, at the beginning. Another tale, another chapter. From his window seat looking out at the landscape appearing under the clouds, Quinn could tell this job was going to be a slog. The Peruvian forest stretched endlessly behind the plain, and up ahead the Andes mountains rose gloriously to meet them. We will land in the Andalus in approximately 15 minutes. The captain said over the speakers in fluent Spanish, tinged with what Quinn decided was a Quechua accent. Quinn O'Connell was an investigator with a unique niche. He went searching for missing persons in the places no one else wanted to. In this case, it was the jungles of southeast Peru. The family of one Siobhan McHale paid handsomely for not only his quite reasonable fee, but also Quinn's expenses for the trip. Siobhan McHale was the lead researcher on a team, working to use aerial LIDAR to locate hidden Incan cities in the Peruvian jungle. There had been several times when spotty communications had led to prolonged time between the team and their headquarters in Ireland, but they had never disappeared for a week before. Once the plane touched down and Quinn disembarked, he set off into the city looking for supplies for his trek into the jungle. Most of his preparation had consisted of making phone calls in advance of his flight. Quinn had already purchased most of the equipment he would probably need. It was more expensive, sure, but it also let him travel swift and light until he landed in his final destination. He was only in town for two hours before, in his newly rented Toyota Hilux. Quinn set off down the craggy slopes to the east, looking for the route out of the Andes and into the jungle. He had his essentials all sorted out and loaded in the back for a long journey. The lone exception was a thick-backed machete, which Quinn placed on his dashboard in his leather sheath, in easy reach in case the jungle got too thick too quickly. His GPS pointed him to Siobhan's base camp, straight as the crow flies. Reality wasn't as amicable, and Quinn O'Connell prepared himself for a hard trip. During the flyover, none of us could see anything through the thick foliage, but the LIDAR detected several anomalies. After analysing them in town, I could make out several straight topographical lines. These are clearly man-made, and notate our first genuine lead in this section of the jungle. It's an exciting find and looks to have some potential, since even if there isn't anything of significance at the site, the lines have to lead somewhere. We are setting out tomorrow morning to find the anomaly. Quinn put the paper back down on the camp table where he found it. He had located the base camp. He felt so far away from the cold open steps and hills he was used to when he had been to Peru before. This was dense trees and vines, like he would have expected to fight through in Brazil. Not here. There were sections of jungle where the research team must have cleared away the underbrush and vines. They had set up several tents in a rough circle, with one larger pavilion star awning in the center. The sounds of birds and insects were deafening even over the wind, making the canopy's trees, limbs, dance and snap. Inside each tent he found several sets of the same gear. There were green duffel bags, metal crates and cots with each member's personal effects shoved underneath. There were sleeping bags on each cot, although Quinn couldn't imagine anyone actually using more than a light sheet in this humidity. Siobhan's cot was easy enough to find. It had her notes organized into three ring binders that took her more space than her duffel bags of equipment and spare clothes. Quinn pulled up the list of researchers on his phone. He didn't have any cell signal, but he'd been smart enough to download the documents he needed back in civilization. There were five members of the team. Andre was the group's guide and LIDAR analyst. Richard and Andrea were the archeologists. Sarah was the geologist, and Siobhan was an Incan historian and the newest member of the team. This was obviously a temporary camp, but one they could use while making shorter one or two day trips deeper into the jungle. There were lots of notes for Quinn to go through, but the longer he stared down at the papers, the harder it would be finding any trace of the team might have left out in the wilderness. He absolutely hated adding more weight to his pack, but he knew he didn't have the time to sit and read through it all here, and he couldn't leave it behind and possibly miss something important. With a grumble, Quinn keyed in the coordinates Siobhan mentioned in her notes, shoved the binder into his pack, and set off deeper into the thick jungle. 
Quinn trudged through the thick brush with his pack on his back, knife on his belt, and his GPS in hand. He had left his Toyota Hilux back at the research team's base camp because the jungle was just too thick to drive through, and there were no roads out here. There were, however, lots of snakes. Most of them made their presence known in their hurry to get out of the scary human's way. At first, Quinn didn't pay them any mind. But as he saw more and more of them, a worry crept into the back of his head. He had traveled to many places for his investigations, and seeing a bunch of venomous snakes was never a good sign. After hours spent fighting his way through a few kilometers of dense forest, Quinn finally stumbled on a lead. The GPS had told him he had arrived at the coordinates Siobhan had written in her binder, but he saw nothing that even came close to resembling man-made structures. What he did find was a discarded first aid kit. There was a list of his contents printed on the inside flap, and after taking a quick inventory, Quinn learned the bandages and pain medicine were gone. A thin coral snake moved around the roots of a moss-covered tree, and Quinn gave it an accusatory glare. But the anti-venom was still in the kit. Placing the first aid kit down on the fallen tree, he put on a pair of gloves and rifled through the dead leaves and detritus on the jungle floor in a wide arc from where he found the first lead. It only took a few minutes, and Quinn had found more evidence the research team had come through the area. There were cigarette butts, a broken water bottle, sheer blue climbing rope, and a knife with its tip broken cleanly as though someone had tried to leverage it against something and failed. The marks on the rope couldn't possibly be from the tip of the broken knife. Not only would that fail to break its tip, but its owner would have used the blade's cutting edge on the rope instead. Cigarette butts were easy enough to explain, as Andrea was a known smoker. The broken water bottle was harder to explain. The ground around the area was mostly level, and there were no indications of a fight or a fall from the trees. It was getting dark, so Quinn decided to pitch his small pop-up tent right next to the researcher's coordinates. It was too late to hike back to the track, and he could start back up when the light came back in the morning. He moved around behind a tree to make sure he wouldn't set his tent up on top of a potential clue when he spotted a large area of disturbed earth against a slight rise in the ground. It was a hole big enough for a person to crawl into. Abandoning any thought of putting the tent up now, Quinn snatched his flashlight from the hook on his belt and shone his beam into the hole. There were scoring marks on a stone on the closest side of the hole where someone must have tried to lift a rock out of the way. Now we're getting somewhere, Quinn thought, and moved closer. There, at the bottom of perhaps a ten meter drop, was a spool of the same blue rope and glinting shards of plastic that matched the water bottle. Reinvigorated, Quinn pulled his own rope out of his pack, secured it around the trunk of the nearest tree, and quickly rappelled down into the dark. It turned out there wasn't a hole at all. When he reached the bottom, Quinn discovered he had actually descended through the ceiling of a large buried structure. He found more evidence once he was inside. There were shards of the water bottle and rope, sure, but there were also shoe treads in the disturbed dust and small pieces of ancient ceramic embedded in the walls. The structure was a long, narrow hallway that moved off into the gloom in both directions. And following the dusty footprints, Quinn came across a small discarded notepad. The handwriting did a match of ons, but the contents were vital, nonetheless. We found the hidden room on the second day of searching. Andre was able to get us down into the building and kept a watch above while we searched, it said. Quinn flipped to another page and scanned some more. We found creeper notes in two adjoining rooms along the southern end of the building. I can't believe it. Surviving physical evidence of a building was astounding enough, but also to find preserved organic rope and... The writing caught off as though something had interrupted the author. There was one more page in the notepad, but it was covered in scratches, like someone had done a rubbing on an object covered in strange markings. Quinn couldn't make any sense of it, but pocketed the pad to continue searching. In the building's silence, the only sounds were the ones he made until... Suddenly... He heard a snap of a branch and a rustle of leaves from above him. Quinn made it back to the hole in two strides and looked up. 
shining his light as he did. It was only a glimpse, but there looked to be a shadow of a person standing just outside the beam of light. Their eyes glimmered for the briefest of seconds until they heard a tearing sound, and his rope fell loose onto the ground in front of him. Then the shade was gone. The rope landed at Quinn's feet in a soft thud on the stone. He grimaced and looked down, sighing. Someone was up there, and they must have been watching him for a while. They knew what they were doing, and they knew when he was vulnerable. It demonstrated it was as intelligent as it was malicious. The pieces were starting to fall into place. The puzzle was still evolving, but as was usually the case, the bad guy finally showed themselves. Moving methodically, Quinn picked up the end of his severed rope and examined its split end. Same knife, he said to himself, voice echoing off the empty stone walls. He could probably lash it to the research team's rope to be long enough to escape, if he could find a way to fashion a hook to tie to the end. There wasn't much in the main illuminated air of the structure, so carefully, Quinn moved down the corridor heading south. The stonework was ancient, but well built. The flagstones held their shape, and there were no cracks to speak of. Something glinted off the shine of his flashlight from up ahead. Moving closer, Quinn found a small ring, severed at its base so as to enable people with different sized fingers to wear it. There was a small green stone of jade housed in its center. He pocketed it, then moved on. It was valuable, and there would be no way the research team would have missed it. That meant they must have never gone this way. Eventually, Quinn came to a large mantled doorway made from the same stonework as the walls and floor. He stepped up to it and peered into its darkened depths, his light doing little to dispel the shadows. The only thing he could make out was the silhouette of a massive statue. Its hulking and ferocious posture dominated the room. Stepping in further, the statue became clearer. It depicted a monstrous four-legged creature lunging forward in an aggressive pose, its mouth open impossibly wide in the sullen scream of challenge or hunger. It was all made of stone, except its fangs. There were rows of long, jagged teeth, each carved from unmistakably human bones. Quinn stared at the creature. The claws on its feet were jet black obsidian, the length of his arm and draped over its back was a shroud of purple cloth. Even with his limited historical knowledge, Quinn knew the color's rarity. Whatever this thing was, it was respected. This was so far beyond anything he had expected to find, but he'd seen the claws and the fangs. Regardless of whatever respect the ancient Inca gave it, he could tie those to his rope to get him out of this pit. He had a job to do, and he needed to move before whoever was on the surface could do more damage. The ancient bones held together surprisingly well, and it took Quinn several tries to break a fang free to use. He had decided against the obsidian because of the chances it might shatter when he had something solid up above. He moved back down the corridor swiftly and as quiet as a shadow, tying the rope into a thick knot around the base of the bone. <laughs> the rope and its tether were ready. The light above was fading quickly, and there was something in the back of Quinn's mind told him to turn around and check the north passageway. The research team was down here, and left without looking down the southern corridor. They must have found something so important they didn't return to finish their work. Putting the tools away, Quinn lifted his light, walked north into the darkness, and what he found only made the puzzle more complex. A tablet. Words. Real words. I cannot believe it. No one has ever found written words in any Inca site. And yet here they are. We don't know any way to decipher them. But the stone was small enough, we're going to pack it up and take it back with us to camp. I was skeptical at first. But Sarah says the geology of the stone fits with the time period. And both Andrea and Richard say the tool marks used to make the etchings match too. If this is real... It is the most significant Inca discovery in the history of the civilization. 
and our names will be the ones spoken of when people talk about it. Andrea took a rubbing of the first of several symbols to work on it right away. I have several resource books on the Inca history back at camp to help. I'm not an etymologist, but I just know we can figure this out. Quinn put the note back into his pack. He had made it out of the hole to find everything he had left up above ripped apart and strewn about the clearing. Luckily, his pack, although empty, was still in one piece. The binder filled with Siobhan's research notes, however, was shredded into long, thin strips which still floated down from the trees like confetti. There was no way of knowing if anyone else was still out of sight, watching him work. But as long as he kept attentive, Quinn knew he would probably be fine. His tent poles were smashed, but it wasn't as though he would try to sleep down here. As dark as it was, the sounds of birds, insects, and the creaking trees would have kept him awake. Even if there wasn't anyone out there, it would already prove they didn't care for Quinn's presence. Instead, Quinn worked through the night, flashlight at hand, laying out the shreds of Siobhan's notebinder on the jungle floor. The sun was starting to rise and true dawn was about to break when he finally found what he was looking for. It's Quechua, or at least what turned into Quechua. The symbols aren't any alphabet any of us have ever seen, but with the small sizes of prepositions in most languages, and the subject-object-verb order pointed closer to Quechua. Once we knew that, Andrea and I could start putting some of the pieces together. A short while later, Quinn found enough strips of paper to reconnect a note page with the tablet's etchings. It didn't make any sense still, but at least he had the whole thing now. Next to those papers was another note that seemed connected, but was made of a different sort of paper. Petiti is real. I know I've said that before, but now it isn't some fanciful hope. The tablet speaks about it by name. It gives instructions on a series of steps we need to take to find its location. Richard doesn't seem to think we need to do it. He says the LIDAR can find Petiti now that we know we are in the vicinity. We can't wait. The lighter will take forever, and there's no guarantee he'll pick it up through the denser jungle. We all took a vote, and we are heading back to the tablet chamber in the morning. Quinn didn't have to track all the way back to the underground structure. He was still outside it. He knew Quechua, and even if he didn't have the tablet itself, he had the symbols. He took breaks occasionally to eat. The shade he would trashed his camp and thrown his food everywhere, but it was still edible if he spent the time to track it all down. Eventually, and with the help of several more reconstructed notes, Quinn figured out the first step on the tablet's list of instructions. And what's proof of respect in its resting place? That could be anything, but Quinn guessed it would be something universal, like a salute, a bow, or kneeling. With more than a little trepidation, Quinn descended back into the gloomy hall beneath the jungle. This time, he took care to bring everything with him, including his pack, despite its added weight. He also detached the line once he made it to the flagstone floor. There wasn't any more rope should the shade come back and attempt the same trick twice. The walk back to the northern room seemed to take less time than the first time he ventured there. This room was not nearly as interesting as the southern room had been. It was probably much more important than Quinn gave it credit for. The only thing in the room was a circular dais in the middle of the floor, with a square pedestal of cut stone where he guessed the tablet had once sat. It wasn't there any longer. When Quinn had come in here the night before, he had found the note speaking about the tablet upside down and slightly crumpled on the floor in front of the pedestal. Something had been tickling the back of his mind since he arrived at the site. Why did the team so carelessly leave their notes lying around on the ground? Why would they leave them at all? It took no effort to keep them secure, and someone had gone out of their way to tear them out and leave them. It was a question he could sort out later, because another thought dawned on him at that moment. There wasn't anything spectacular about the chamber except for the tablet, or no other etchings or passageways out of the room. The answer must be in the flooring. Sure enough, it only took a few seconds of searching before Quinn spotted the slight rises 
on four of the stones. A person could only depress all of them if they were to kneel on their hands and knees, spread apart as though in supplication. He pressed them down, and all at once, the wall set away revealing another corridor to the east, and the smell of rot came with it. Quinn steeled himself against the stench and stepped up to the doorway. He examined the cut of the stone which had fallen away so clean and straight. It was as if the door had always been there. Shining his light ahead, Quinn followed the path for a few feet before he saw another piece of notepaper crumpled on the ground. The only way out is through. I'm going to leave these notes behind like breadcrumbs in case our lights run out of batteries. If for some reason someone else is reading this, it is too late to turn back. The door only stays open for a few seconds. And as Quinn finished reading the words, the stone wall fell back into place with a bone-shaking bass or thud. Quinn had some explicitly violent thoughts in the echo of that shutting door, but he got himself under control. He was a professional, after all. Note said the team would be leaving more notes behind as breadcrumbs, and he would follow them. It may or may not get him out, but he might finally start answering some questions. One thing it didn't clear up, however, was why they hadn't mentioned the notes left from before. He put the thought out of his mind for now and continued down the passage. After a few minutes walking through the corridor, which narrowed in a few places, Quinn found himself inside another chamber. This one was similar to the room with the hulking statue, except there was an empty place where the statue would have been. The walls here were different though. They were lined with human skulls embedded in between the stonework, like mortar. There was another note lying crumpled on the ground in the middle of the room. We are on the right path, I think. There was another challenge here on the road to Paititi, and luckily the exit didn't seem to close after Richard went through. We were smart this time and separated the group so we could reopen the way if it were to close behind us again. This one was easier to translate, and all it took was blood. I can't believe no one else found Paititi before. These instructions aren't hard to complete just finding the starting point. Quinn pocketed the note and moved past the skull-lined room, confident he was still on the correct trail. The floor began gently sloping upwards. It was so slight Quinn almost didn't realize it, and he began to feel the strain in his legs. After every hundred meters, the passage turned left, till it came to the next room. This one was in rougher condition than all those previous. There were roots on the ceiling and walls cracking the stonework and dislodging quite a number of slabs from their places. They lay strewn around the floor. In the center of the room, there was a gaping circular hole from which the rotten, desiccated smell seemed to flow. And next to it, another note. We deciphered this instruction before we even arrived in the room. I think after working with the text for a while, we are getting used to it. Even if we weren't, this one would not have been hard. It was just a single word trust. Once we made it to the room, the word made sense. We couldn't just throw a stone in the pit. We wouldn't be able to tell us what was down there, other than how deep it was and what the bottom was made of. Sarah objected, but there was no other choice. Now, we are all jumping into the pit to prove our trust in Quiven Rimmer and cement ourselves as true Cholichiki. It is the only way to find Petiti. And we've come too far to give up. Quinn looked down into the hole in the floor and couldn't see anything. He didn't have a teammate to jump down the pit first and report back what they found. Moving quickly, he hefted one of the square stones and pitched it into the gaping moor. After a count of three, he heard a splash. There was water below, and its echoes sounded deep. So, with nowhere else to go, and one last check on the seals of his pack, Quinn held his breath and jumped into the pit and the dark waters below. The water was deep enough to break Quinn's fall, and thanks to his quick reactions, his pack didn't drag him down into his depths. With four strong strokes, he made his way over to its edge. He still held his flashlight and, holding it up, realized he was no longer in a building. Instead, gigantic stalactites pointed down at him in jagged, 
menacing lines fixed to the ceiling of a cavernous hollow of unworked limestone. The cave held three passageways, leading off in different directions. The first seemed too small for him to fit through, even if he left his backpack behind. The second looked to twist and bend, sloping down and away from the pool in the center. And the third, however, Quinn spotted the body of Sarah, lying crumpled in a heap on the slick floor. There was pooled blood under her mouth, and her eyes stared out into the darkness, grey and lifeless. Behind her lay a note. Sarah didn't have the spine for the faith the tablet had showed us. There are no more translations. Its words live within us now and must be freed. She did not have what it takes to spread the lost words buried from the world, but we do. Sarah tried to attack us when we landed in the pool. She said we had gone mad. We were just beginning to see. I think Andre and Richard are understanding, but the way Andrea looks at me, all I see is fear. I don't believe she will free herself to the Quirin Rima. We must be ready to take her words by force. Quinn knelt down by Sarah and closed her eyes. He rubbed at his temple to clear his mind from an oncoming headache. It had been too long since he had slept, but he couldn't stop here. He knew then something had gripped the research team and they were tearing each other apart over this tablet in the search for Petiti. He had to be close, and he had nowhere else to go but onward. He could sleep when this was done. Standing, Quinn made his way down the third path and... After a time, the gloom settled about him like a cloak of heavy darkness. The air, under the odor of death, felt stale and primal. Finally, Quinn made it to a fork in the cavernous passage, and with it another note told him Siobhan and Andrea went down the left path, and Richard and Andre took the right. They were losing their minds if they hadn't lost them already, and Siobhan's writing meandered through the tablet's translation and the theory of its meaning. The words intertwined into the nonsensical, and then into the same runes Quinn had seen on the tablet's initial rubbing. He had come looking for Siobhan. When the better options before him, Quinn took the left path and continued on Siobhan's breadcrumb trail. He smelled her, before a bend in the tunnel revealed the body. Andrea's body was sprawled out on her back, in front of a dead end with cuts across her arms like she tried to defend herself, until something punctured her throat. The blood here was dry, so far away from the humidity of the pool. At her side, Quinn saw a note, and his stomach turned before he even began reading. She was writing in broken slurry of English, Aymara, Ketchua, and tablet scratches. Praying Andrea, only lost words, Richard, with luck. Petiti is only for the worthy. Griffin Rima knows the trilogy key from, I must make. Way ready for those who will follow the route. Open, faithful. My notes will lead them. From there, the words descended into nonsense again. Siobhan had come this way and hit the dead end. There was only one other choice. Quinn no longer wanted to find her. He needed to escape this place before it became his tomb, along with the others who had already died. He came back to the fork in the path to find another note. He was sure he had put the first one into his backpack, and just to make sure, he opened it up to look. This was new. Someone was down here with him. All this time, Quinn had thought he was alone, and that whoever had cut the rope was still up above. But what if they had come down after him, keeping their distance in the dark and the quiet? He felt for his knife on his belt. It's tempered steel, spine giving him courage as he examined the note. I found the exit and set the trap. The place closed at the camp and more at the entrance to the structure. I left notes for more people to find. I placed the ring just as Quiven Rima instructed. Its presence will be found. I am sure of it. Infectious to its bearer and more so to anyone who hears its bearer's word. All will be Jalachiki. And the lost words, and I will be given glory. A petite. Quinn's headache had steadily grown since he dropped into the cavern, and now with this note, he was almost frantic to leave the place. 
he looked up and scanned his path back to the pool with his flashlight. There was no one there, at least not that he could sense. He knew he hadn't passed anyone coming back from the dead end. That left the final passage. He unsheathed his knife from its thick leather scabbard and stepped into its twisting dark. A cavern ten times as big as the jagged pool stretched out in front of Quinn. He had hurried through the twisting maze of the cave for close to an hour without finding a single piece of evidence. Anyone had come this way when he finally found this hall of raisins and ruin. Tens of columns, holding a solid roof aloft. And along that roof there were skylines. Real, true light shone down in beams that her eyes accustomed to the dark of the cave. The light illuminated a floor covered in spiked stalagmites and bones. There were so many bones, and all of them human. They were all ancient, even. Quinn could spot some clothing still clung to him in places. The clothes looked handmade, but from all errors he could recognize, and several he couldn't. What is this place? he thought aloud. A voice behind him made him jump. It is the temple of Quiven Rima. Quinn spun, shining his light back into the tunnel, and held his knife tight in his right hand. Siobhan? He asked cautiously. Not anymore, the voice replied, and a mangled form stepped out from behind a pillar into his beam. It was Siobhan, but she was different. Her clothes were tattered and dirty. Her hair was mostly gone, and her figure was gaunt compared to the pictures her family had shown her. Charlotte Chaki? Quinn asked. I see you found the ring, she said. The ring was still safely stored in his backpack. What ring? Your words are lies, but spoken in the lost language beyond, she said, taking a step toward him. Quinn matched her stride in reverse, keeping a healthy distance between the two of them and keeping his knife out. She continued forward and Quinn had to glance behind him to make sure he wouldn't put his foot through a spike. Instead, he stepped in something soft and wet. Richard and Andre helped revive the words, and I was strong enough to tame him to pay Titi. Hear me, Quiven Rima. I've done as you asked and brought a sacrifice to the solid Chikian Hall, she said, moving forward at a sudden sprint. She passed Quinn without even a sideways glance and went into the center of the towering room. Quinn looked down and saw the broken and dismembered bodies of Richard and Andre spread around the floor beside the masses of other bones. He could not contain himself anymore and had in rage at its inhumanity. Why would you do this? This were your friends. Finding some loss at ease and worth all this. Think about your family, Siobhan. Think about what you've done. That was not the geologic here said a new voice from the edge of the chamber. Its voice growled out like concrete through a wood chipper. It stemmed into one of the beams of light and Quinn saw the living, breathing twin to the monstrous statue. She's done well bringing you to me, but I must gather my strength for all to come. You will live my lost knowledge soon enough. And you will spread it as she has. But you will travel further. And the lost words will infect many, many more. She did not have the strength to leave by the time she reached me. But she made the way easier for you. The great beast leaped from where it stood to land inches from where Siobhan stood arms wide and greeting. Take me to Petiti. I am yours, Siobhan said. You are mine, the beast answered. But you are not worthy of Petiti. You are a shell with barely enough life left to sustain me. But I am your Cholich key. Your chosen teacher, I showed this man the words lost. They're within him now. I can show others. <laughs> the beast growled again, this time in apparent agitation. You would not survive the 
jungle would devour you. And if you didn't make it out, the mountains would destroy you. You are only good for one thing now. It said, and opened his maw, impossibly wide. I see, was all she said, as the fangs descended. Quinn stared on, dumbstruck. Finally, his body responded to his mind's screaming attempts to escape. He looked wildly around and spotted several stalagmites of different heights he could use to reach one of the skylights. He tore off, feet almost slipping on Siobhan's spraying blood. The ripping sounds ended, and the pressure in the cavern increased as the Quirin Rima launched its mass towards him. Quinn dove into a baseball slide along the wet floor approaching the first column. The beast landed hard into the wall past him and spun to take another leap. It roared this time in challenge. You will know the words, it cried. It swiped one impossibly long clawed hand at Quinn, but he sidestepped the heavy blow. It only grazed him, upsetting claws slicing through his pack and sending his sleeping bag and food spewing out onto the ground of the cave. He reached up and grabbed a hold of the next pillar, and pulling himself up narrowly avoided the monster's second swipe. No. It screamed at him in deep, guttural fury. Then, just as Quinn's next leap took him within arm's reach of the hole in the roof of the cave, power struck him. It seized his mind and made his head explode in twisted, writhing agony. Everything spun, and Quinn felt himself falling from the pillar. Just before he landed, everything went black. Quinn O'Connell woke up in the grass at the edge of the jungle. He had no memory of how he got there. He sat up and the blood rushed to his head, making it pound so hard he threw up onto the ground. After he collected himself, he took stock of his surroundings. His backpack was ripped, but nearby was his rented Toyota Hilux, with the keys in his pocket. Inside the truck, he found the research team's binder, filled with their notes. He didn't know how he had escaped or how he came to be at the edge of the jungle. But he remembered everything that had happened in the cavern beneath the buried Inca structure. Quinn looked at one of the notes in the front of the binder. It was one he recognized from where Andrea had died. Freeing Andrea was much simpler than I had expected. Surely he held the lost words, but not their meaning. Richard will have finished with Andre if he's had any luck. Petiti's only worthy. Kriven Riemann knows that Chola Chiki from Pretenders. We are close now, and I must make it to its temple. The tablet has spoken whispers to me, orders to make the way ready for those who will follow. The route will be open, but only for the faithful. My notes will lead them. He could read the words, and before, it was nonsense. Horrified, Quinn looked back at all the notes he had collected from the team. There in front of him was the paper with the original rubbing, but the words were in English. He threw the paper on the ground and rifled through the binder to find another. It was the one after Siobhan had killed Sarah, and her words appeared as sound and as rational as he was now. There was no proof to show the family. The words lost were within him now. You will know the words. And thus, the story is ended. The tale told. The chapter closed.